Uh, good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for the, uh, the, the participants to join this webinar. It takes about uh, 20 to 30 seconds for um, everyone to join. We have at the moment about uh, 120 people uh, joining as I speak. And the moment we get up to about 250 or 240 or so of the 300, 400 plus people that we've got registered for this event, we will start. We will start the webinar. Well, good morning. Um, we've got a number of people already joined us. Um, uh, my name is Tom Jenkins. I work at ETOA. I'm, I, we're having a, a webinar very much on the situation governing um, the China market. Um, the Chinese market, as everyone should be well aware, is one of the most important and fastest growing markets for Europe and the world. Um, back in 1918, over three million or nearly three million people uh, applied for Schengen visas for, for Europe, and there were a further uh, three, four to 500,000 coming to the UK. So we're looking at roughly three to 3.5 million people coming over to Europe from China, spending billions of uh, euros of, of currency here. And so it's become an enormously important market, in some ways the bellwether market for, for the growth markets throughout the world for Europe. Um, the situation concerning COVID-19 obviously um, ch started in China and China was the first place really to conquer um, the, um, the problems concerning COVID-19 within the population. And we're now looking to China in some ways to see how it is we emerge from this lockdown that we're experiencing. I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by um, three people who are going to help us go through some of the issues. Um, um, we're privileged to have Dr. Adam Wu, who is the um, Chief Executive Officer of CBN Travel and Mice and of the World, of World Travel Online. We have Sienna Paulus Cook, who is the Director of Communications from Dragon Trail. And I'm delighted also to be joined by Kate Zian Britton, who is the General Manager for Sea Trip, based over here in London. Um, I think before we start, I would like to have a show a quick video really from our sponsors. Um, we at ETO have launched uh, City Fair as an online uh, marketplace, and this launched a place yesterday. And we have a short promotional video that lasts two minutes that I'll show you now. Coming up. Welcome to City Fair 2020, Europe's B2B networking workshop for destinations, organised by ETOA, the European Tourism Association, in partnership with European Cities Marketing. This year's City Fair will be more important than ever as we look forward to 2021 and beyond. The workshop will offer one of the first occasions to have open and productive conversations about client needs and their demands for new and adaptive travel product as we enter recovery. 2020 is an exceptional year and at ETOA we've been hard at work to respond to the changing circumstances, finding a solution to best serve the needs of the industry and our members. A live in-person event would not have been practical this summer. Instead, we will now deliver our tried and tested B2B networking workshop online. City Fair 2020 will provide over 5,000 high quality meetings between European tourism suppliers and those taking their product to market. A perfect opportunity to reconnect with existing contacts and meet new leads discovering new ways to work together to ensure a successful and sustainable recovery. The registration and appointment matching system are not changing. As usual, we'll ask you to select and rank your counterparts based on your preferences. We'll then use this data to create dedicated appointment schedules. Of the day of the event, rather than attending in person, all you will need to do is log on to our online portal and participate in your meetings via video link. Once the day's sessions have begun, and again, exactly like a typical ETOA workshop, your meetings will run according to schedule. Our system will log you into the next meeting automatically. Sign up today and join your industry colleagues in this cost-effective way to help stimulate the recovery of the European tourism industry. Select, connect and meet. Share your priorities and we can make the most of these very real opportunities on offer in 2021 and beyond.
Well, thank you. Um, now, um, in order to start, I was going to invite um, uh, Sienna Polis Cook to do a short presentation on perceptions of what's happening uh, from Dragon Tail's point of view. Sienna, do you want to do the presentation? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, just checking how to um, share my screen. Okay. All right, can you see that clearly now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Tom and ETOA, for asking me to speak today. I'd like to share some findings from a few recent reports that Dragon Trail has published, which address some questions around when and how Chinese tourists will travel again. So in March, we conducted a consumer sentiment survey, and at that time, around half of the respondents indicated that they were planning to travel again. And from this group, we could see some major trends emerging about how they plan to travel. So for example, we saw increased interest in uh, going to less populated places, in nature and self-driving and small towns. 15% of the respondents um, said that they were more interested in wellness tourism than they were before, especially tourists in their 30s and 40s, so born in the 1970s and 1980s. The crisis also made Chinese people closer to their families, with 35% of our survey respondents saying that spending more time with family was a positive aspect of the lockdown period. So family tourism was already a significant segment of the Chinese outbound tourism market, and we would expect to see even more of this going forward. So as to reasons people gave for not traveling, these largely fell into two categories. And the first of those uh, was economic. Um, people who don't have as much time or as much money to travel going forward. Uh, but the second and the more significant one was related to health, hygiene, and safety. And 12% of our survey respondents said that they were too scared to travel. So being able to provide assurances about hygiene and safety is going to be really crucial moving forward into recovery. We found that younger Chinese travelers, so those in their 20s, born in the 1990s, they were the most optimistic demographic. They were the most likely to say that they would travel again soonest. And they were also the most likely to actually um, plan on increasing their travel budgets going forward. We also found a lot of variation in when people expected to travel again. So instead of a surge at any given holiday period, Chinese tourism is likely to come back slowly and in small waves. So the first of these possible waves would be the summer holidays and then October's golden week. Um, although of course this depends on um, the recovery of destinations as well. Our other reports on Chinese tourism trends look at data for international tourism brands accounts on Chinese social media platforms WeChat and Weibo. On WeChat in the first quarter of the year, although international tourism from China dropped off completely during this time, generally speaking, average readership of content published by tourism boards and tourism businesses actually increased in the first quarter of 2020 compared to 2019. On Weibo, engagement was down overall, but not for the leading tourism boards accounts. So from uh, this data on WeChat and Weibo, we can see that Chinese consumers are still looking at and interacting with content online about international travel. So this shows that there's still interest and an appetite for this kind of tourism. Some European destinations got far higher than average views for content about health services and medical news, especially um, towards the end of January, beginning of February, where people were really concerned about these topics uh, in China. On Weibo, Edinburgh got followers to vote for leading pulmonologist and SARS researcher Zhongnan Shan uh, for a local award as he studied at Edinburgh. And a lot of destinations from Asia to Europe attracted engagement on Weibo with content that related to film and TV shows. That's obviously um, people were watching a lot of uh, movies during the lockdown period. 
Tourism Austria also had a big hit with a Weibo post that they did about free online concerts from the Vienna State Orchestra. So you can read a lot more examples and um, kind of analysis of the kind of content that did well in our reports. The WeChat Q1 2020 report came out a few weeks ago and is on the Dragon Trail website and the Weibo Q1 2020 report will be published tomorrow. So these are just some of the most successful ways that tourism destinations we're able to hold Chinese consumers' attention um, during the crisis period and hopefully sow the seeds for a medium to long-term tourism recovery. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sienna. Um, that was particularly interesting. I was uh, very taken with your first slide where you um, pointed out that there was a strong um, there's, there's a strong desire for people to travel whenever there is a chance. And it's very heartening also to see the latent demand um, for Europe as a destination within China. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute, I'm sure. Um, in the meantime, I, I just want to um, ask Kate, who has a very short presentation as well, to do that. But I believe I'm gonna be running it from, from my desktop here. So Kate, you need to tell me, um, when it is you want me to click through, but let me get it launched to start off with. Thank you, Atar. Uh, just need to. That's fine. I think you can see that now, I believe, yes? Yes. Okay, you, that's your first slide. Morning, everyone. Um, thank Tom and Elisa for uh, inviting me to join the webinar. And so today we'll be discussing the crisis and the recovery for the Chinese outbound market with everyone. And first of all, I would like to give you a very quick introduction of our company. So Trip.com Group is the largest online travel company in China, and we are expanding very fast in the international market. We have made some acquisitions quite recently, including Skyscanner in Europe, and we become the last shareholder of Make My Trip, which is the largest OTA in India. We currently have over 400 million global users and across platforms, and 80% of the bookings come from our mobile apps. Uh, we are a one-stop shop for travel products, which including over 65 different kind of travel products, including flights, hotels, and etc. So Tom, if I can trouble you to go to the second page. Thank you. So there's no doubt that um, um, the industry is now suffering um, the major blow from the crisis. But it's good news to see that uh, currently uh, China um, travel market is uh, slowly recovering. So if you look at the chart, uh, this is hotel occupancy in Chinese domestic market. So according to the uh, recent trip.com user survey, 80% of the customers are willing to come back to travel after COVID-19. And the trip.com's flight ticket data shows the search volume for May holidays is actually higher than last year for domestic travels. Um, this hotel business in China, comparing to US and Europe since uh, middle of March, is definitely uh, increasing. And we haven't gone back to where we are expecting because uh, based on the, um, the, the forecast, you know, we were expecting much higher than where it should be. But it's definitely um, a promising trend looking at. So Tom, can I trouble you to go to the next page? So after discussing about how it is happening in China, I just wanted to uh, share some of the uh, campaigns and the activities we're doing in order to um, um, help the recovery to go back. So, um, so we uh, Trip.com is deep in the recovering phases, and one of the major uh, campaigns we're doing is called the Safe Stay campaign. We aim to provide our customers with safe and reliable accommodation options. So on the website, apps, and all the online um, um, activities, we uh, we have the criteria for hotels and in order to who are interested in joining the campaign. So we will specify the the, the activities I've been doing. 
and all the details uh, are also on the extra net and uh, the hotels have with our with our hotels uh, with our um, trip.com so um can we have the last page please tom and also in order to um obviously currently we are looking at the recovery for a european uh, market and we are following three stages so first of all we are uh, started to search and plan for the trip. And uh, obviously we can see that the first should focus on the domestic market, uh, similar to the marketing activities we're doing in China. And we're also uh, looking at uh, flashy sales and uh, launch the safe state program for the European and hotels. And uh, thirdly, and we also are trying to looking at the pre-pay um, online products, which we are promoting a lot for hotels in China, which gives the customers a certain period they can, you know, buy the vouchers uh, for hotels or restaurants, uh, food and beverage um, um, products in advance, and they can use within a certain period, which gives customers a bit more um, time to plan and also, you know, more flexibility because we can see currently the uh, you know the, the 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 flexible terms conditions are very important and also popular for customers so that they need to feel you know safe and comfortable to travel and we need to provide them the flexibility in order to allow people to have time and you know plans to 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 to, to plan their travels so um last but not least and uh, we can see that currently and um, yes we are not getting to where we are but by looking at how it is in, you know, the, the China travel market is slowly coming back. We feel very um, confident and positive that, you know, we're looking at quite a few um, good bookings and numbers come through for uh, Chinese and um, October national holidays. And also we have seen the bookings for next Chinese New Year is coming up much quicker than before. Obviously, people are having the faith in the travel market and the people are keen to travel. We are just patiently waiting for the right time to travel when we are safe. So we should stay positive and strong, and you know we'll go through this together. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thank you, Kay. I'll just get rid of my screen. Right. Um, well, thank you very much. I mean, that was um, really quite positive in the circumstances. It's not often I say that things are looking positive. Um, uh, the I mean, you're, you're saying that. 85% of the, the respondents, admittedly, who are looking uh, on your website uh, are still very keen to travel. This isn't a random sample, of course, because they're already looking at a travel website. But um, uh, it's still very heartening to hear that uh, nearly five-sixths of the, of the people watching um, are really interested in doing so. There's obviously a need to be safe, um, but there's also a need for flexibility because the situation can change at any moment, and we know that. Um, yeah. We've got to be very realistic. There's a danger of a second wave. Um, lockdown may occur again. So whatever they book, they want to be sure that they can transfer and move these bookings onto other areas. But um, that, that, you know, that, that, that's genuinely heartening in, in some ways. Um, Adam, um, you yeah. are a very distinguished um, expert in this field, and you're also a CEO of a large company. Well, what is the situation like for you? I mean, how, how is the situation from your angle? I'm optimistic and I uh, hope most people in the travel industry are. The risk is, uh, like you yourself, would be in the travel industry for a long time. Uh, I've been involved in outbound travel from China probably longer because I was one of the earliest being sent overseas back in 1986. So you imagine this 30 odd years now. I lived it in outbound travel and uh, I see the growth. So from, you know, only 16 of us were sent overseas at that time to, let's say the official figure of over 100 million of Chinese visiting overseas uh, last year. So it's a phenomenal growth and this won't stop. I even the COVID-19 because when you recount what happened with 7-7 bombing in London, all other countries led by USA immediately placed the you know, travel warning to London. And Tom, you may recall that uh, the first ADS group from China actually arrived five days after 7-7 because it arrived on the 12th of 
uh, July and uh, well received by uh, the then I think the chairman of the Visit Britain and then Prince Andrew even in the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Tower of London and then we went up all the way actually to uh, Edinburgh and so on so it was one of the largest group at that time led by one of the vice chairman of uh, CNTA, you know, the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. So we actually led the way of, uh, you know, set example that nothing, even terrorist uh, attacks, would not stop Chinese from traveling. Now, I wouldn't say that every Chinese will be jumping on the plane once the lockdown is over. But what I can say is, given 1.4 billion Chinese around, if one is concerned, there are certain number of people certainly always concerned, but three of them may be lined up. So that's why that's, uh, the optimism uh, come from the real uh, figure, uh, which has been confirmed by even recent opening in China during the May Day holiday, that uh, with a significant surge of visitors that some places already crowded, so that's domestic travel. And we also see, we have not stopped even receiving inquiries uh, during the lockdown that uh, we've been dealing with uh, companies even inquiring when we could, you know, start receiving uh, Chinese delegation for training because they do that training year after year in the UK. I'm talking about because my own experience and our company, the CPN Travel Mart. So I didn't, you know, prepare any uh, presentation as you suggest. It's better to talk. Is we've been uh, the dealing with Chinese outbound, not just from China, but we've been receiving hundreds of thousands, I would think, that of uh, groups of uh, different uh, delegations of officials, business people. That's the time when I met even Kate uh, when she was uh, working in Langham, you may remember, recall the Langham Palace received many, many Chinese groups so that, uh, uh, and of course, uh, you know, other uh, visitors, business executives, we did a lot of events overseas, you know, large events for 5,000 people in Royal Abbey Hall and so on, the Huawei, uh, the, the annual meeting and so on, that's a general meeting. So those are the examples where uh, I'm happy to share on uh, what the Chinese outbound to operators now, the MICE organizers are still inquiring, but what they are doing, knowing that the lockdown is not yet lifted in many destinations, they are preparing. Actually, we saw on our World Travel Online that I uh, put on the, uh, uh, the message there, you can click on that large number of uh, destinations are being very proactive in getting their message across that we are still open. So in other words, we are getting ready for the lifting of the lockdown. And of course, we will still welcome you. I think the message now is the positive message say, yes, you know, COVID-19 and the lockdown is affecting the travel industry, but nothing will stop people from moving around and traveling. And uh, once the lockdown is over, the Chinese will be among the first traveling, uh, you know, to various destinations. So that's what I would think that uh, most people, those in China and those dealing with China are experiencing for now. Well, thank you very much. And it's, um, again, um, I'm taken aback by the uh, level of base optimism that, that exists out there, um, both confidence in the source market and in the destination. And it, 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 in contrast to America, and it's maybe because we're coming out from a crisis in China and we're emerging from it very clearly. Uh, we're getting a, a, a much more positive outlook than those of us who are still in the throes of a crisis at the moment. Uh, this is quite heartening. I mean, um, so do, do you, would you agree with uh, this general impression that we're getting that there is, there's a basic level of optimism in the Chinese travel market at the moment? Do you, do you think that's the case, Kate? Sorry, say that again, Tom? So, uh, do you, I mean, the impression I'm getting from all three of you is that, I, I'm just trying to ensure that I'm getting it right, that there, there is a fundamental level of optimism that we're moving back towards a growth pattern uh, certainly from where we are at the moment and that there's real there's real interest in the market for Europe as a destination definitely like I said earlier that uh, you know I um I we had a uh, internal meeting uh, recently just looking at the numbers so 
from last week, actually, as we speak, and both hotels and the flights, we definitely can see the submit numbers are definitely increasing. And, you know, most of the bookings we, we see for um, a little bit uh, longer lead time, uh, because I think people are just being cautious. Um, but we, especially last week, our hotel business, we see uh, the the largest jump since 16th of March, since the, uh, the lockdown started. And from the flight side, obviously, um, we we actually have has a great 2019. You know, flights we got uh, um, double digits of growth, and the hotel business is three digits. And even for January, we see a very very good pickup before the uh, uh, the coronavirus started. But uh, you know, just uh, in the last couple of weeks, I think even the lockdown is not officially uh, stopped, and we can see people are getting more positive and we see the numbers every year so we're, we're checking very uh, frequently i know i mean i'm being we, we've got an online um uh, set of questions which are rolling in from the audience at the moment and our audience is around about 250 people at the moment i've got a question really is you know are any flights bookable for europe at the moment and if they're not when do you think they're going to become available does it kate do you have an angle on that uh, well, I'm not expert on flights, but as far as I can see that, uh, you know, and there are flights available uh, from June start and, you know, in and out of the UK. I don't think the border is is definitely, you know, it's like totally closed. But obviously there's a lot of terms, conditions. And also I think you need to have uh, quite specific reasons to travel. And so I, I, I can and I, I read the news that I think BA is planning to um, I resume their flights in early July, but I think like Tom, you mentioned earlier, things like this are all changing from time to time. And I think, you know, and um, if the, the, the crisis is, is controlled in a good way, that we actually have a very better chance to obviously opening up um, quicker. We're actually going to have a meeting with our flights department um, tomorrow morning. And uh, so uh, I'm hoping to get some more information from them as well. Well, let me know. Adam, yeah, I will. <laughs> Adam, I mean, do you think uh, the flights are going to be coming back sooner rather than later? Yes, all the announcements clearly indicate uh, even the American you know, airlines start preparing for flying to and from China because they know when China you know, lifted lockdown earlier and there was no more than just recent, yes, they only had, uh, you know, 11 the infection that's just minimal you know less more people getting flu or any other diseases than COVID-19 there and uh, many other destinations as well that I saw a figure yesterday from Nepal they only all together had uh, you know hand, hundreds not thousands even the infections so that so the destinations are opening up eagerly and uh, of course airlines cannot stay you know on the ground forever they will seek the first opportunity and preparing themselves in just literally proper, just providing better facilities, I would say that in tracking and uh, you know providing more safer environment on the plane, and for people to recognize the fact that still the infection of COVID-19, I know it's infectious, but the fact that the people die of it, uh, obviously you know the the the, the uh, in in comparative terms is still smaller or not as you know a lot of people worried about so it will be over and the airlines will be back flying again probably in different formats and of course uh you know people i hear in, even in the uk the radio that the presenter said look as soon as the, the lockdown is over they will be the first on to the you know flight uh, you probably uh, attended the webinar by uh, Sam Calder, uh, uh, he just said, I'm ready. You know, if the flight is taking off tomorrow, I'm on the plane now. Uh, yes, I would think that uh, as soon as the flight leaves, there will be people traveling, probably with proportion, and, uh, uh, you know, service providers like hotels or, you know, other transport providers just need to be ready in the sense that they're ready to assure people that when they come to your hotel, they are not going to check into a room that others just left about a half hour ago. That mm -hmm. practice may need to change, which means that the hotels get themselves ready and then quarantine that room for a, you know a day or two, you know, uh, depending on the season. And then when the people are arriving, then they are sure that this room hasn't been stayed uh, by anyone for within the last 24 or 48 hours. I think people will realize it. So yes, that's good. You know. So I think, uh, given 
if they take all these precautions and assure people, both the destination and the service providers, people will feel assured. Like we all go out to the still shopping, we still go out uh, doing things. We are not locking down. That means that we all just in a room or in a house. We still go out and we feel okay. So we just need to get that message across there. As far as we take precaution, and I think life will go back to normal and has to, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen on the um, on the webinar, we're, we, we've got questions rolling in, but we're going to ask you one question now, just to see what the um, uh, sentiment is in the audience. And I'm going to launch a question which simply says, thinking about Chinese travellers' sentiment in Europe product development, which of the following do you agree with? Travellers will be looking for less crowded destinations. And uh, remember that um, we got an insight um, that a lot of the inquiries were still for um, the more popular destinations, um, but that's just one observation. Travellers, travel recovery will be domestic and neighbouring destinations. Operators will offer new normal programmes and offer, operators will offer new destinations and attractions. Uh, this is being launched now. I'd be very interested to hear your um, reply on it. Meanwhile, um, I just want to um, uh, just carry on. Um, when, when do you think demand is going to return? I mean, we're, 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 we've got to come, come and fix some kind of angle on it. Uh, do you have any opinion on that? When do you think, um, when do you think the, the market's going to recover from China? We're hearing sooner rather than later, but do you think that's true? Uh, from China to Europe. Yeah. Uh, I think that there are a lot of factors that that depends on. And um, I mean, we've talked about the tourism industry itself and flights wanting to resume. We've talked about travelers and um, their appetite for travel. But I think there are a couple of very important factors. One of them is um, just public health. Um, obviously will be very important and um, how fast and how effectively the countries are able to control the outbreaks um, and handle those and provide the kind of uh, assurances to travelers. And the other big part is, um, you know, official government policy. So currently, if you leave China and come back, then you have to go into 14 day quarantine. They're talking about when international travel comes back to the UK that travelers will have to go into 14 day quarantine. So uh, 14 day quarantine is not exactly conducive to a holiday. And um, over Europe, we still have most countries have their borders closed. Um, so I think we'll have to wait to see kind of how that progresses first, um, but certainly the appetite is there. And those of us who provide tourism services are excited to start um, and reopen again but uh, we do have to see kind of how uh, how the crisis is dealt with and when countries are able to reopen and when it's easy for uh, Chinese citizens too to be able to go in and out of the country so obviously it's being um, tourism is being trialed now with domestic travel in China and there is a big uptick in that especially the a May 1st holiday that we just saw um, this past weekend. But it will still, it's, I think it's a long and slow road. Um, we're on the way to recovery, but it, it won't be overnight. And I don't think that we can expect that the October golden week, for instance, will be any kind of Chinese tourism to Europe like we have in years past. No, it won't be full recovery. Right, I'm not going to, we've had over um, nearly two thirds of the people watching this webinar have voted on this, and I'll give the results in a second. But I'd just be interested to hear from um, Adam. Hey, Adam, what do you think uh, this recovery is going to be contingent on? Uh, you, you talked about airlift earlier. Do you think the airlift, are we going to be led by the airlines in this area? Uh, in terms of mode of travel, yes, but of course, depending on the destination, because certain destinations don't need airlift, so they can still travel uh, across border and so on. That's, uh, but what this really depends on, 
is the uh, strategic decision of destinations if they are confident enough to leave the borders and then to start issuing visas or reinstate the visa free travel because certain destinations that just invalidated the you know visa free travels and no one can come in even if you don't need a visa so once those policies do change and i do believe let's see that uh, if this can be materialized most countries do feel they need to grow the economy like you can see the uk they are lifting from tomorrow it's not the right time most people will say still too early but they are eager to do that because they know that the economy needs to restart but of course the travel and tourism is a major industry in certain countries given spain for example and the many european destinations now the summer season is coming up so they don't want to miss out obviously they have to be very carefully monitor say yes gradually lifting when it's not uh, when it's not causing the you know the the R factor goes up to one, they may feel more confident. And say okay, let's go go go, and probably buy the golden holiday again from China. If we come back to China, uh, the outbound travel will you know resume to a certain level. To nearby destinations for sure, because a few days ago there were eleven ministers of eight ASEAN countries already agreed on uh, helping each other with the travel and tourism because you know, those countries are less affected and more confident. Europe is coming out, I, I hope this is case soon. Uh, and uh, so, you know, given the summer as a real test, then it may just go a bit further. And airline, it's genuinely just the way for long haul travel that has to, you know, uh, get started before people can travel. So, the, but the policy goes first. I mean, I mean, I what you're really saying is that uh, clearly we've got to open Europe up before we can sell it. Um, what is the situation with the um, with, with the consulates in China? Are they, are they open at the moment, or are they? I think they are all shut at the moment, are they not? Or they're not issuing visas? Do you, do we know when they're going to open up and start doing so? Does anybody know this? Kate, do you know any answer to this? Well. I don't think the, the the British embassy has uh, has stopped at the moment. I I don't believe so. Um, well, I know some. Uh, I remember my uh, my my team talking about Russian and and stopped for the visa for a while, but I don't know if it's reopened. Um, okay. But I, I don't think the British embassy currently is is stopping that yet. Okay, that's okay. Well, we maybe we have a whole list, uh, Tom. If you want, if us also want to know. Our World Travel Online, we update that almost on a daily basis. There's a list mm. of countries that are, are starting issuing visa, like you know Thailand and so on, that already announced, and some consulates were open or going to open. It's a very up to date list on our World Travel Online. Also, it's in Chinese because it's aimed at Chinese. So the two operators are going, you know, to our websites, checking that on, on a daily basis. The visitors can check that as well. So I just need to find it and then I put under the, the, the uh, do we have that function here that we can put, uh, uh, you know, some information? Adam, we do, we print, a, we publish the summary of the uh, webinar immediately afterwards and we can include it in that okay. summary. That would be a very useful addition. Sure. And we've got the results of that questionnaire. Okay. Um, uh, thinking about Chinese travelers' sentiment and product development, um, the winner was that 43% felt the travel recovery will be domestic and concentrating on neighboring uh, destinations next door to China. 28% uh, said that travelers will be looking for less crowded destinations. 20% um, felt that operators will offer new normal programs. Um, and maybe that's what um, Adam was alluding to in terms of increased sanitation and um, reassurance to consumers. And only 9%, so the clear loser is that operators will offer new destinations and attractions. That partly conflicts with um, travellers will be looking for less crowded locations, but we'll see. Don't forget, um, no, uh, no destination in Europe at the moment could reasonably be described as crowded. Um, it's um, if, if you're looking for a new normal, a completely empty London and Paris is the new normal you're looking at. Um, I do, I'm just trying to think, we looked at assurances. Um, I, I'm intrigued. Um, 
Adam, you mentioned that um, people might be wanting to uh, be told that their hotel room will, will not have been used for 24 hours. Um, we hear elsewhere that um, social distancing will be required at certain attractions. Uh, we hear that capacity on some transport routes will be reduced. Um, I suppose what I'm asking you is how realistic is this? Um, you know, if you're a hotel, you can't afford to keep 50% of your bed stock in quarantine all the time. Uh, if you're a transport operator, you need to fill those buses, you need to fill those trains, you need to fill those aircraft. And I, I think there's going to be, is there going to be a tension between um, uh, the people's ability to travel and by ability, I mean the commercial availability of tourism services and their need for reassurance in terms of cleanliness. Sienna, do you have an angle on that? Um, well, I think people will need reassurances in terms of cleanliness. Um, and you're right. I mean, I've seen a lot in the, the US actually about, I mean, domestic flights are still going on there and the tension of uh, people being very upset about being on crowded flights when they thought the flight would be empty. Um, I think that there are a number of things that tourism businesses can uh, think about doing to implement to provide people reassurances. So I read that, for instance, in Singapore, they um, will create kind of um, a formal Mm, hygiene standard there for hotels and you'll become officially accredited um, because of your hygiene policies and then this will be something that the hotel can display and consumers will know about so I think if destinations can put in place things like that um, certain accreditation uh, programs for uh, especially the accommodation sector but even attractions as well that might make people feel a lot more assured um, about staying there and whether that is something like quarantining the room. I think in the long term, uh, absolutely you're right, um, hotels can't quarantine off half the rooms, but when we're talking about kind of medium term, when travel comes back, um, we're not going to go from uh, zero to 100 percent overnight, so you'll have fewer travelers coming in anyway, so it will make those kinds of um, uh, kinds of policies a little bit easier to do. Uh, one concern that I think is especially relevant for the Chinese market uh, coming to Western destinations is face masks. And, you know, in uh, China, uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, other Asian destinations, uh, wearing face masks is very common. It's something that was accepted well before the COVID-19 crisis. And so, uh, for instance, when they reopen museums in China, people will be required to wear face masks to enter. And I can just imagine that Chinese travelers going overseas to Western countries where um, there isn't so much acceptance of people wearing face masks, that this is something that might make them nervous. Um, so I've seen just uh, yesterday or the day before, the mayor of London has now advised that anyone taking public transportation wear some kind of facial covering. And I think that encouraging people to, to adopt this kind of behavior um, is one of the things that will make Chinese and other Asian travelers feel safer when they uh, come to these Western countries. Uh, and Kate, is, is this an issue that you think is important? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Sienna. I think, you know, um, you can see that um, uh, most hotels in China, they're all open now. And I think one reason that to um, make people comfortable and they're willing to uh, to go there is just because they, um, uh, you know, the most people in public, they're wearing uh, 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 masks. I think, you know, and also the, the government and all this, you know, uh, information we received is that it's uh, it's uh, definitely uh, much safer to be outdoors. I think you know. To be honest, I go out. If I do a running, I don't wear masks. I know probably I shouldn't because it's quite risky. If you wear masks when you're doing uh, a lot of activities, but indoors, you know, it's just much more dangerous uh, for the virus to uh, spread. And if you go into a hotel in a lobby, 
and you know you can keep on saying how clean it is just that did all the hygienic um, uh, cleaning but also if people see other people are wearing masks you know that definitely give the especially uh, Asian customers uh, more reassurance you know and it is actually helping to because you can see you know things are much better under control in China but most people even our colleagues in the office now so many months now they're still wearing masks when i have zoom calls with them you can see they're all wearing masks in the office okay. yeah well it, it notoriously makes lip reading extremely difficult uh but the um uh, adam do you think the masks are now going to become absolutely normal uh for tourists and for those people dealing with tourists in future it genuinely depends on how comfortable one feels i genuinely don't feel when i wear mask comfortable that keep touching it is uh, just defeats the purpose but just come back to your early question on the affordability of the hotels and the service providers can they afford having you know half full now mm -hmm. they are surviving now with complete lockdown so the you know the fate is to survive and i'm sure the the the, the recovery won't be just overnight making all the hotels are planned full so they will get used to it by making sure that they gradually increase the capacity. And in, in the sense that this, you know, we will return to a new norm, which means that in the past, people arrive, wait there for the room to be cleaned. I never feel comfortable when, you know, if I have to be waited and then to go to a room that they just cleaned in a rush for half hour ago, it's not the right thing, I would say. They had to do because they were so busy, overcrowded. But now we come to a new norm that the hotel just have to bear the fact that, you know, just to make it a certain periods or even just, uh, you know, sanitizing, you know, even before COVID, most of the toilets you can see say, oh, it's been sanitized. In China, even the, you know, lifts before COVID the still say it's been sanitized and so on. So I think they will just make that a new norm and then gradually increase the capacity and so on. So that will happen. So we can't go from one extreme of no visitors to overcrowding. I think uh, this also may lead to a new norm in the travel and uh, tourism industry. So that is a natural kind of uh, hindrance now of preventing mass tourists, mass tourism that does damage the environment, for example. So a lot of people were against that rightly. And now without even people demonstrated against it, you know, naturally people won't go to crowded places. So this mass tourism won't happen naturally maybe it's a good thing sometimes you know the chinese philosophy is the yin and yang so every single thing has two sides like a lot of people say the lockdown actually helps the environment look at the sky you know it's the blue sky <laughs> how often do you see the blue sky on a daily basis you know this is something we have to look at the bright side okay i think i think the adam your perception that we need to thank covid19 for the beautiful weather we're having uh, <laughs> we wouldn't say that, but, uh, <laughs> I, I say that everything if we just look at the you know doom sides we were doomed but if we look at the bright side i mean everything i mean it's, it, wouldn't you agree that you know everything has bad and good side but this I is the side I, effect I would, I would which not, happened to be bad one i would not question that perception i i think that I mean, uh, there was, it has been said that um, global warming uh, made every fine day look faintly sinister. Um, but I think at least, at least um, COVID-19 has rid us from that worry. Um, I'm gonna be launching another question now because we've got three questions to ask our, our audience. And the new question I've got is, thinking about the industry across your market, what do you think will be the biggest challenge after the crisis, assuming this crisis passes? Will it be economic resources and access to financial support? Will it be cancellations and refunds? And will it be retaining talent? Uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of restructuring, and that's to put it very politely within the industry. Um, uh, how are we going to retain the, the, the expertise that we've, we've gathered over the years? So I'm going to launch that question now. And while that question is being answered, um, I've got a, a a technical question almost has, has, has come through from the um, from the audience, which is to say much of the Chinese group market is founded on extremely long payment terms to operators, not to mention very small margins. Do you, does the panel believe that credit terms will become stricter or do they feel this is a sustainable model given general industry nerves about cre credit and bankruptcies? Now, this is um, 
a straightforward question on payment terms. Uh, Adam, I, I'm going to ask you again very quickly because you, you, you are directly involved in this at the sharp end. What's your perception on that? On the sorry, the question or just the, what you write up because I'm still no, reading. George, I'm, I'm talking about the question. Uh, the question on uh, do you think payment terms are going to change dramatically in the new new environment? If that is going to change, I think the insurance has to come to play so that uh, the consumers or the advanced cooperators are somehow insured against something like this happens. I know that. Uh, Incoming service providers have been hardly hit of uh, uh, not receiving those money or received have to return. And then I think uh, it may well come to that, but there has to be a solution to help the other end, which is the insurance, so that uh, when this does happen, then you know they get the money back from the insurance rather than from the supplier. So let's see if the, you know Etoa has the power to lobby. Uh, various, uh, you know, the the uh, authorities and so on. See if that can become a new norm of, uh, uh, you know, compulsory insurance. For I think a lot of people do that. But uh, if uh, such, you know, uh, the the, the uh, major incidents can be covered, rather than not. No, I mean I, I think you, you're raising um, issues which are uh, quite fundamental, and I, we hope that we're going to have a webinar in the near future covering. Uh, issues surrounding payments. But um, uh, Kate, is this something that uh, crops up at all in the payment terms? Um, I think people are going to get very sensitive about that in the near future. Well, yeah, but because uh, we, as, as online business, most of our um, payments are done through our virtual credit card. Yeah. So, um, well, I think this obviously won't change much after uh, the, the crisis. And I think in and personally, I feel you know the, um, you know the, the I think the cancellations and the refunds will definitely I think in the in the short term, if anything, probably the rest of the year is gonna be something uh, from our partners and the, and the trip.com have to be aware that it's gonna continue. So uh, now we can see the the response from um, hotels and the flights are obviously and um, very uh and. Um, prompt to following this because we know the importance to give the flexibility to um, to, um, to 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 the customers and uh, we're in a very lucky situation that uh, you know in our our UK office here um, and our London office you know the business term, uh, team is is all uh, still working and all that but so to answer the last question but uh, I totally can sympathize you know this is a very uh, challenging time and for the whole industry you know and um, but you know it, it is a situation we just have to be strong together and i'm sure we will go through this and um, so yeah i think the cancellations and the refunds is something we definitely have to be aware that it's gonna carry on for quite a while i, I don't think it's gonna be it's gonna be an issue sienna is this something dragon trail are aware of or cover at all um to the extent that we cover it i mean at least at the, the beginning of the crisis, uh, we did look into this, especially in terms of kind of B2B communications. And when kind of overnight there was announced uh, a policy that all group tours, both domestically within China and um, leaving China were to be canceled um, with just a few days notice, uh, obviously that put huge financial pressure on the Chinese tourism industry and the advice at that time was to do, I mean, that was far before we knew that um, how global this crisis was going to become. Yeah. But the advice very strongly was to do everything that you could to support those Chinese partners so that they could be able to stay afloat um, and that any kind of kind of flexibility or anything that you could do to help them at that point to um, get some of the money back or be kind of lenient about things like um, changes and cancellations would bring goodwill and, um, and a better business relationship in the long term. Um, so as Kate said, yeah, it's something where um, we as an industry, it's difficult for everybody, but everybody needs to work together um, to help us all keep afloat. I think, I think that's, that's very valid. Uh, I think it's, um, I, I'm just looking at the results of the most recent poll we've done, which I'm now closing. Um, again, we had two thirds of the people voting. Um, uh, we are at a, in a period 
despite the comparative optimism of the discussion we've had, um, the current state of tourism in Europe is that there is no demand and there is no product. Um, there is effectively no business. And so it's hardly surprising that the overwhelming response um, from the people who answered our survey was that three quarters of them felt that economic resources and access to financial support will be the number one issue when we emerge from this crisis. Um, to, and further 22% uh, felt that cancellation and refunds sorting out the mess that was caused by the sudden introduction of the lockdown um, will be important and 7% were worried about retaining talent. Um, I'm going to ask the, the, the main question to my audience now and then I'll ask my panel because we're going to be we're running very close to the end of this webinar. I just want to know, thinking about the recovery, when do you expect the first significant wave of Chinese visitors to arrive in Europe? Is it July, August and September 2020? October, November, December 2020, or 2021. So it's really up to you to interpret what you think the word significant means. But I imagine it's more than a token volume. It's it's real numbers, whatever that is. I'm going to launch that now. And as I launch that, I'm going to actually ask, um, I'll start with Kate this time. Kate, when do you think the recovery is going to happen? Just, it's this isn't the C-trip angle, this is the Kate angle. When do you okay. think so? Well, so uh, from my uh, perspective, I, I can see currently, you know, it's still more about Chinese visitors uh, traveling domestically, you know, inside China. Uh, you know, they just passed from, you know, uh, initially only just within, the, you know, the same city and uh, they travel across different provinces. And uh, see my dad, uh, you know, the family went out, you know, during May holidays. It's all very uh, promising. And we can see that the people are, quite keen to travel abroad uh, near China. So I think in July, August would move for, uh, you know, Shoho and countries uh, near China, like Korea, Japan. And we, we, we see that actually, you know, it is happening. People are planning their uh, summer holidays and, and, and uh, in Asia. And I, I feel quite uh, um, uh, confident about, you know, business will come recover much more for October and you know the 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 the, the, the second uh, you know our uh, bank holidays in October the first the week of uh, uh, October is normally very popular and we can see that the bookings are come through and I thinking you know it is really good time for us to preparing and for all, all you know the travelers coming and I think in Europe that's a time I feel quite confident about and of course, you know, 2021, that's the Chinese New Year. And people probably wanted to book something just obviously, you know, planning in advance. And uh, I, I genuinely feel, you know, you know, after this, this is crisis, it couldn't get worse. You know, this is the worst. We are just going through the worst period. But, you know, there's always, a, you know, lights at the end of the tunnel and we are just going to see that very soon. Right. Well, there's a quote from King Lear that answers that point. But I will, uh, I will uh, dodge it. Sienna. Uh, very briefly, when do you think it's going to happen? You can give me a, a, a one sentence answer. Uh, I have to say I com agree completely with Kate, uh, where in the summer we should start to see some outbound travel, but to nearby destinations. And I again agree completely that the October holiday in China is the first time we could really expect to see Chinese tourism to Europe although that is contingent on Europe opening up and the health crisis being uh, resolved enough at that point here in Europe. Alan? You, asked, you, you, you did say that's how we determine the significance. Now, the real significance uh, 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 growth of uh, visit to Europe, obviously, specifically, would be to 2021. But I also agree with the two ladies there that uh, uh, we will triple in, triple in uh, October-ish, uh, because October is four months away, so, you know, things should uh, uh, clarify by then. And uh, starting with the business travel, as we focus on MICE, because we already got the inquiries asking for that period anyway. So I would think that is a gradual from October onwards, business groups, shopping toward the end of the year, and then the major return will be 2021. Okay, and the answer is that the audience profile um, broadly agrees with us. They think 31% felt that we're going to see a recovery in the fourth quarter of the year. 68%, um, nearly 70% said that we're going to need to wait until 2021 till we see any real volume. 
we have left so many questions unanswered. There's an entire um, discussion almost breaking out in the question area uh, as I speak, which indicates um, they're very interested to know that we are advocating lower capacities uh, in hotels and um, transport modes. Is the Chinese market willing to pay for these extra things is the big question, but this is not one we can answer now because we've run out of time. It's really just to thank Sienna, Kate and Adam for contributing to a really interesting uh, webinar. Thank you so much. This is going to be going, this has been recorded. It will be available on, uh, on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you for taking part in it. Thank you for the audience for being so responsive. We've had, um, still have nearly 250 people watching us at the moment and nearly two thirds of you have voted in, in our polls. So this has been most successful. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you everyone again uh, shortly when we come back to discuss this in even more optimistic times. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, bye now.